the minimum wage debate in this country is huge. Huge. You see the fight for 15 going on among fast food workers across this country. You've seen some cities pass a $15 minimum yeah. wage. Where do you fall on that fight? Yeah, so I have probably three perspectives. One is the perspective of our franchisees, the independent small business owner with low revenue, decreasing margins because of accelerating, whether it's real estate costs or food costs, um, and now accelerating labor costs. And so I very um, seriously appreciate the economic challenge that right. that presents. Um, but I do believe that there is also a capitalist argument to be made for higher wages, because if you pay better, you will attract more talent, you will keep those people longer, but then you have to do the hard work of holding them accountable for good work. So that, that's one point of view. Uh, the other is from a, call it a national or global enterprise point of view, it's really hard to plan your business when you have no idea what the wages will be in 100 cities in the next year. Um, so just from a pure planning standpoint, it's really difficult to be thoughtful and answer the question, well, how will you combat wage increases? I don't know, what will they be? And when will it come into play? So how high can you raise the price of a cinnamon roll or a pretzel to cover accelerated costs in any category? Uh, what are the other efficiencies through technology and other things you can do in your business that allow you to pay more competitive wages? So the fight for living wages for higher minimum wage is something that I absolutely support. But I also believe there is a very planful uh, collaborative approach that needs to be taken that has not been taken across the country. And what's unfortunate is it has become a political issue um, and it gets so politicized. The answer is not $15 an hour tomorrow. It's right. not. Um, the answer is also not keeping it the way that it is. Um, and so that's not a cop out. That's not a refusal to have a position. It's an acknowledgement of the complexities involved and a deep desire to be a part of the conversation. What about running um, profit? <laughs> We're in Washington, D.C. Yes, D. we are in Washington, D.C. You know, you never know. I get asked a lot, you know, will you run for office? Um, my answer used to be, I can impact the public sector more from the private sector. And then I had a, a mentor of mine say, one, if you keep saying things like that, as influential as you are, you're going to steer away really great people who want to serve. And two, the right answer is you should go to where your talents provide the greatest impact. Um, so my answer is different now. My answer is not never, it will always be the private sector, but my answer is I will, I will always fill the role where I feel I can make the greatest impact. And if that is purely in the private sector, it will be purely in the private sector. If it's bridging the worlds of public-private and really helping to elevate social impact businesses, mm -hmm. then that's where I'll do it. So there are two CEO candidates right now running for office in the Republican uh, side, uh, yeah. Donald Trump and Carly Fiorina. Does, does business acumen, does that resume, that experience lead to potentially better uh, governing right now? Because it seems like the American yeah. electorate in the polls is telling us that's what they want. Yeah. I don't think business experience, period, can lead to better governing. I know many CEOs that have run their company for a long time mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily strong in influence, but rather command and control. Uh, and the, the government requires a great deal of influence and being a bridge person, bringing people together. So do I think business experience is needed more today than it ever has been in our government? I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. But that alone does not a president make. Is there a candidate you like right now? Mm. I like a few, um, but I'm probably most in Hillary's camp right now. I truly believe that she has the connections and the experience mm -hmm. and the influence to get things done but I do have great concerns around how likable and believable she is to the American public. Is that because and of the emails in large part? I don't think it's because of the emails. I'm so tired of the freaking email conversation. Um, like get on with the issues, people. Um, but I, I do understand that it brings into question trust and, and that is a core issue. Um, I don't think it's because of the emails. I think it's generally because of, of her style and how she mm -hmm. presents herself in large groups. But I've spoken with so many people that have had one-on-ones with her where the sort of the cool, chill version of Hillary, the approachable version, comes yeah. out. Um, and I appreciate how difficult that is to balance that approachable, likable, this is really me, with having to put on the game face because right. you're being attacked from all sides at all times. I can't imagine what that's like. Um, but can appreciate the challenge. Um, so I, I don't think she's a clear runaway winner, um, but I certainly would love to see someone in office, maybe who isn't, it, maybe they're not the most likable right now, but 
No one cares about their likability if they're able to get things done. Yeah. It's about their ability to bring people together to come to the best solution.